things I think we're all familiar with, whether or not we like them or not, are um, previews. Uh, previews of TV episodes that are to come, or now we call them trailers, trailers for new movies um, that are going to be released, or maybe even new products that will soon become available. Um, and the purpose of a preview is to whet our appetite for something that will be coming soon. And advertisers do this often for upcoming holidays. I don't know if you guys have started hearing about pumpkin spice already. Anybody big fans of pumpkin spice? Yeah, that reminds us that fall is around the corner. When I went into Safeway the other day, I noticed that there was Halloween candy out already. And I thought... Oh my goodness, probably ought to get some of that, but the kids will never see it in their bags if I get them now. <laughs> it's a preview. It's something to let us know something's coming up. And in our study in the Gospel of Mark, we're going to be coming this morning to Mark 9. And it's all about a preview. Jesus provides a preview for three of his disciples and for us of his upcoming glory and kingdom. It's a preview to help us be reminded as we wait for Jesus' return that glory is to come. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 9. And it begins in verse 1 where Jesus promises a preview of his coming kingdom. It says, Then he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. Well, the setting of this, I think, is appropriate. They needed a preview. They needed encouragement because this is right after Jesus had revealed that he would die. And he told them, as disciples, there are sacrifices that you're going to have to make. So why don't we take a minute and look back up just a few verses to Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 34. It says, Calling the crowd with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to follow me, follow after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? What can anyone give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I don't know about you, but if I was one of those followers and I was hearing about the kingdom to come, I was going to be excited. I'm gonna, I was going to be anticipating this. And then he lays this on him that I, I'm going to die. And that... that you're going to have to deny yourself. And some of you will literally take up your cross. All of a sudden, there's this sadness. There's this somber mood that's overtaken them. And they're needing a preview. They're needing a reminder of what was going to happen. And he promises them that some of them who were there hearing him would see the kingdom of God come in power. I don't know about you, but I think if I heard those words, I would be thinking, wow, the kingdom's coming, that we're going to experience it, that we're going to be in it, that we're going to be reigning with Jesus. But that's not exactly what he said. He said that they will see the kingdom of God come in power. This wasn't the kingdom coming in all of its fullness. It was a preview. They, they would see it. They'd be getting this, this sense of, look what's to come. I'm going to give you just a little piece of it to see. And that's really the, the whole question is, how do we interpret that? What was he referring to? Well, one thing that we know for sure is it wasn't his return to reign in his millennial kingdom. Because that hasn't happened yet. That's something we're, we're still waiting for. And maybe you're like one of the disciples and you're saying, Lord, Come quickly. I wish this would happen right away as I, as I look around and see things in the world and, and see the problems that we have in our country and we see diseases that are raging all over. We think, when's this kingdom coming? And that's what his disciples were thinking. 
And so he assures them by telling them, some of you are going to witness the kingdom's power. You're going to see it. And we'll see what that means exactly. Some people believe that this was a prediction of his death and resurrection. Well, I think if we look closely at other scriptures, we realize it's actually something else. It's a preview of his coming glory that they were going to witness in the transfiguration described in these next verses. In fact, in 2 Peter, uh, Peter's second letter in chapter 1, verses 16 to 17, I think he clarifies it by saying, Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice when it came from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter looks back many years and he's saying, You know, this was a turning point for me. Witnessing this preview of Jesus' glory helped me understand better who he is, and it impacted my life. I think for all of us there is an application point that Jesus knows what we need to encourage us in our faith in difficult times. Maybe like the disciples, you, you heard bad news, or maybe you've come to a realization that uh, something difficult's around the corner. And Jesus wants to encourage you. So are you open to how he might want to encourage you? M my guess is none of us are going to experience what the disciples experienced. That we're not going to go up to a mountain and, and see Jesus transfigured up there and hear the voice of God declare who this is. But there are other things that happen in our lives that can encourage us. So when you're down and discouraged, what might God use to help you back up? What's he used in the past? I know sometimes it's a small thing, but God uses that to lift our spirits. Maybe it's reading a verse in the Bible. Any of you read a verse or maybe you come across a, a devotion on your, on your phone and it just speaks to you? I know I've had that happen to me many times where God's word just comes alive and it encourages me and we say, that's what I needed for today. Or maybe it's listening to a message or maybe it's hearing a song or, or maybe someone sharing a testimony. That's what you needed at that moment. That, that was maybe that little preview of heaven that you needed to hear. Or maybe it's just something simple like the encouraging words of a friend or a family member, or even a stranger. A couple weeks ago, I, I shared a, a story about when my brother and I were hiking, uh, going up to Hanging Lake, and we were wanting to quit about 20 times. And there were people along the way that encouraged us, people that we didn't even know that said, you know what, it's worth it. It's just a little farther. And sometimes it's something simple like that, that you just need to hear that, you know what, you can make it. I noticed uh, on Facebook my daughter puts a lot of stuff about struggles she has as a young mother and I see the comments and usually they're really encouraging. And I think probably of, of any of us, moms of preschoolers need that. Is that right? Probably so. Um, or, or grandparents or, or those of you that maybe um, have, have a kid that's off to college. You need an encouraging word. It's going to be okay. Everything's going to work out. Perhaps for you it's, um, it's good news. Or maybe it's an answered prayer. Maybe it's a positive medical report. Or maybe it's an a unexpected blessing. You know, this one uh, just came to my mind. One of the real blessings that happened to us this summer on our, our trip was um, there was a hailstorm. And you think, how could that be a blessing? Well, my wife has an older car, and it got hailed. <laughs> and we got a pretty good-sized check, way more than we probably could have sold that car for. And that paid for most of our travels. Was that a blessing? Yeah, that was a blessing. Little things like that. I don't know how much the insurance company thought it was a blessing, but for us, that, that, was, that was a blessing. Just little things. 
And I want, I want you to think about that because later on in the, in the message, I, I want you to be able to share maybe some way that God has encouraged you. One, one uh, God sighting perhaps you've had. And I'm going to have a few of you, if you would like to, to, to share that um, in a few minutes. But these, these disciples, their lives were impacted by a revelation of God's glory. And we see that in verses 2 to 8, the preview of Jesus' coming glory. It says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves to be alone. He was transfigured in front of them, and his clothes became dazzling, extremely white, as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he didn't know what to say since they were terrified. A cloud appeared, overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Well, what's going on here? Well, verse 2 gives us a little background. It tells us that Jesus is taking his three closest followers on a, a prayer retreat. And um, his, uh, his appearance has changed. It's transfigured. The word in the original is metamorphe, which is a metamorphosis. That There's something that changes about his appearance, and even his clothes are, are changed, and his glory is shown to them. We hear the word glory a lot as we read the Bible. What is God's glory? Have you ever thought about that? Well, I looked that up, and one definition is God's glory is an expression of God's unique greatness found in his character and attributes. And it could be his power or his majesty, his holiness, his righteousness, or his goodness. And in this case, it was something very visible. Um, and the where, it said earlier that they were in Caesarea Philippi, and so it was probably near there. And it was a tall mountain in northern Israel. Most scholars believe that it probably was uh, a mountain called Mount Hermon. Um, and the when is, it tells us that it was six days after Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah. So we, we have kind of a, a setting there. And as he describes it, you listen to the words. It says, he was transformed in front of them, and his clothes became dazzling, extremely white as no launderer on earth could whiten them. His clothes were glowing. His face was glowing. There was something about uh, looking at him that it said that the, the disciples were terrified because it wasn't something normal. It wasn't something usual. And I don't know about you, but what that reminds me of is every time God made an appearance in the Old Testament and allowed his glory to be shown, they call it the Shekinah glory that was in the tabernacle and in the temple, that was something that just about blinded people because it was so incredible and so not normal to uh, an, an everyday vision or an everyday sight. And the thing that I think is most closely related to this was when Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. Do you remember what happened? That his face was glowing to where the people said, we can't even look at you. And, and that's not what was happening with Jesus. He wasn't getting the reflection of the glory of God. That was his own glory actually coming out from the inside. It wasn't that he was, you know, receiving some glory or or something was being reflected from another source. It was actually something that was part of who he was. And then something really strange happens. And, and I think without an understanding of the Old Testament, you might not really get why this was happening. But it says, Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. Maybe you're familiar with this story. Maybe you're familiar with this part of the gospel and I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Why Elijah and Moses? Why would they be the ones that appeared with Jesus? You know, if I was to pick my, my favorite characters in the Old Testament, my thought would be David. How come David's not in there? He was, he was the greatest king. Well, 
as I studied this, it seems like the scholars would agree that the reason why it was Elijah and Moses is that Moses represented the Old Testament law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, where he delivered God's law to the people. That told us something about the holiness of God. And then Elijah is often thought of as um, the prophets, the, the second part of the Old Testament. Uh, that Elijah would represent the prophets. So Moses and Elijah would be all of God's revelation up to that point, the law and, and the prophets. And so it showed the connection between Jesus and God's ongoing plan revealed in the Old Testament, that, that there's a continuity there, that, that Jesus wasn't the uh, founder of a new religion, but he's one that fulfilled what God had promised in the Old Testament. And so Peter's excited. I don't know what your thought would be if all of a sudden you see Jesus transformed up there and then you see two heroes of the Old Testament, Elijah and Moses. You're thinking, I don't know what to do. And it says that they were terrified. They didn't know what to say. But Peter always says something whether or not he's planned it, whether or not he's thought through it, whether or not it was something intelligent or would even be appropriate. But he said, let's, let's build these, these shelters, these, these dwelling places. Let's, let's do something. Let's not just sit here. Let's, let's do something. And so he says, let's build these uh, shelters or tabernacles. And he was probably thinking about the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles in Zechariah 14 when God said that he would live or reside with his people. So he's thinking, you know what? This is the greatest thing I've ever seen, so let's continue it. In, in fact, I'm going to build these shelters so you guys can all stay here with us. That, that Jesus in his glorified state and, and Elijah and Moses, we can, you know, all, all be together. But really, it was coming from a place of not having a clue what's going on. Th this was not the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Peter was afraid. He didn't know what to say. And you know, in reality, if you think about it, if his motive was that this was going to fulfill Zechariah's prophecy that God would reside with his people, he didn't need to do that because there was Jesus. He, he was the picture of God residing with his people. He was God's dwelling place. And so what does God do? I, I think this is funny, and we don't get the whole... We don't actually get, I think, the whole sense of what's going on here. But it says that um, God kind of interrupted him. It says, a cloud appeared overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Do you hear the implied shut up, Peter? Is that, is that in there? Any of your versions have that? that that's kind of, I think, the idea there. Peter's going on and on, saying what he wants to do and all these things that he thinks uh, maybe could take place. Why? Because he didn't know what to say. But God wants to get to the point here. God the Father wants to put the focus back on Jesus. And he affirms Jesus as his beloved son. Do you remember when this happened before in Jesus' life? happened at his baptism, that, that, that right at the beginning there, the beginning part of, of his ministry, there was a voice that came from heaven affirming who Jesus truly is. And if you've been here as I've been doing this series, you know that this was kind of building up to this point, that this was to be the hinge or the focus that they were to understand who Jesus is as the beloved Son of God. And not only that, the right thing to do isn't to build a shelter. What is it? It's to listen to him. Listen to what he's saying. And maybe specifically what he's saying about the fact that he came as not the conquering Messiah, but as the servant Messiah. As the Messiah that ultimately would give his life for his people and then rise from the dead. So in verse 8, to make things clear, this isn't about Elijah and Moses. They, they're not there anymore. Um, Jesus is standing alone before them. Elijah and Moses are important, but Jesus represents 
a higher authority as God's son. So for us, there's a principle. By revealing Jesus' glory and announcing his love and approval, God the Father declares Jesus' true identity and authority. If the miracles weren't enough, walking on the water, feeding the 5,000, um, the healings, the casting out of demons, then this preview was going to be something that would be burned in their mind. They saw this. They were there. They heard the voice that this isn't just a prophet. This isn't just a teacher, a rabbi. This is indeed God's son. And so for us, I guess the question I have is, how has God revealed Jesus to you? I doubt any of us have had a, a, a vision or an experience like that where we've heard the audible voice of God and a, a, um, a glorification of Jesus, a transfiguration of Jesus like that. And then secondly, how do you respond to Jesus' authority over your life? How have you responded to the voice of God that says, listen to my son, listen to to him. I want to take a minute before we finish this passage and just to hear from you. Um, has anyone had a, a God moment recently? Maybe it was just something where someone encouraged you. Maybe it was a verse of scripture. Maybe it was uh, you were going through a hard time and you got some good news or, or something happened in your life where you, you really sensed that God was speaking to you or encouraging you or lifting you up. Uh, maybe it was through a family member or a friend. Maybe it was through um, watching uh, a program. Maybe it was through watching The Chosen. I don't know. But uh, what, what might be something that God's used in your life fairly recently? I mean, I don't want it to necessarily be something when I was five years old, you know, this happened. But any, anything that's, that God's uh, shown himself to you or encouraged you or or, or spoke to you from? Last Tuesday, I started up on a spiritual mindset and was encouraged to go through the chapter and it's not really up to me to take over the rest of the chapter. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything God used in your life recently that's... Jerry? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Tom.
You know, it seems like sometimes we expect the transfiguration to, to be the thing that, that uh, helps us or encourages us or reminds us, but usually it's little things. And, and I think what we need to do, I've been listening to this audio book on, um, on hurry and how hurry is the enemy of a, a believer's life. And sometimes we don't slow down enough to hear God. Because God speaks to us all the time. You know, he, he might not speak to us in an audible voice like those three disciples heard. He might, he might not speak to us in a, in a transfigured Jesus. But he speaks to us all the time. But we have to slow down enough. We, we need to listen for him. And so that would be my encouragement is that you look for those, that you anticipate those. It, it, it might even catch you off guard once you slow down what God wants to say to you and how he wants to speak to you. As we continue in this passage, we, we come to verse 9, and there's some questions that, that follow this preview. And, and I want to just take a few minutes and, as we close, cover those. It says, as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept this word to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. Then they asked him, why do the scribes say Elijah must come first? Elijah does come first and restores all things, he replied. Why then it is written, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did whatever they pleased to him, just as it is written about them. Jesus often in the Gospels instructs his disciples or people that he just healed not to tell what they've seen or what's happened to them. And this is the last time he says that in Mark's Gospels. He, but this time it's a little different. He says, you can once I've risen from the dead. That's when it will be okay. That's when it will become clear after my resurrection. Uh, they didn't understand this. They're still not sure. In fact, it, it says right there that they're, they're uh, questioning what rising from the dead means. You, you see, in the Old Testament, they understood that there would be this uh, resurrection at the end of time for the evil and for the good and that there will be a judgment that takes place. But for there to be a rising from the dead before that time didn't make sense to them. And so they were questioning what this all meant. And as they were thinking about, well, Jesus just revealed to us that he's the Messiah King. He's the deliverer of Israel. How does this work out with death and rising from the dead? It was still confusing to them in their mind. And so as they're thinking about what they were taught, what the teachers of the law taught them, they knew that in the prophecies it said that Elijah must come before the revealing of the Messiah of the, of the Deliverer. And indeed that was true. You see in the Old Testament Malachi spoke of Elijah coming before the day of the Lord when he would come in power and judgment. In fact, I'm going to read uh, Malachi uh, chapter 4 verse 5 and 6. It says, look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. So they're thinking, Messiah doesn't need to suffer and die. He, he's going to return in glory and set up his kingdom. But if that's true, if Jesus is the Messiah that was to come, where's Elijah? Malachi said Elijah would come first. Well, Jesus affirmed that Elijah would come before he returned. They didn't understand. There was two comings. There was a coming of Jesus now that they had witnessed, and there would be a second coming later on where he'd come as the conquering king. If you know the book of Revelation, you know there's two witnesses in Revelation 11, and from their descriptions, most scholars believe one of those was Elijah. And so this is something that we as believers today still can anticipate, that Elijah will come before Jesus returns. And then he refers to the prediction of the suffering and the rejection of 
the Son of Man. And that fits with Isaiah 53. And he reveals John the baptizer took on the role of Elijah as the forerunner of Jesus, the Messiah. And he suffered and died as well. The reason we know that is we look at the other gospel accounts in Matthew 17, it describes this, then it adds the phrase, then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. I don't get how this works, but John the Baptist had the role of Elijah, that he was the forerunner of the Messiah, but yet he was rejected just as Jesus was to be rejected. Luke 1, 17, when um, John the baptizer was, was to be born and the prophecy about him was given to his mother and father, it says, and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. So there's the connection that John the Baptist or John the baptizer was fulfilling that role of Elijah before the coming of Jesus, his first coming. And so a principle today, just as suffering came before glory for Jesus, so also we as his followers can expect rejection, suffering, and even death before we experience heavenly reward, resurrection, and glory. The disciples needed to hear this, that when suffering came, they weren't to be shocked. They weren't to say, none of it was true. Why is this all happening? They were to understand that that was part of the plan. And they endured it as martyrs. And they endured it and would later receive glory. In application, it's only when we recognize who Jesus is and what he's promised for us that we can endure the trials and sufferings of this life with joy and with victory. You know, it's sad for me when I, I see believers going through a hard time and it causes them or the way they respond is to turn from God and say, God, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I expected. Where are you? When all through scripture, Jesus set the pattern that there will be suffering. There will be difficulty. There will be hard times. But glory is to follow. And sometimes we need those little encouraging moments. We, we need these testimonies that some of you have shared today. We, we need those things to encourage us and remind us that it's going to be worth it. I was reading a, uh, a missionary letter from uh, a friend of mine that I, I went to seminary with and his wife wrote a part where she was talking about um, they work with uh, Muslim people and there's a, um, a Bible school that, that they're part of and there's this one lady that they had met there, a young woman that um, has a terminal illness and she recently, the doctors told her that she wasn't going to survive and there was nothing they could do for it. And they told her, you know, you don't have a lot of time, so you probably want to maybe rethink going to this Bible school. And she said, no. This, this is what I believe God wants me to do, and this is how I, I want to invest some of the last days of my life. And so the rest of the, the letter talked about how the other students rallied around her, and, and they were singing, and they were sharing scripture. And it, was, it went from a sad time a, a, a time of, of perhaps grief to a, a, a time of joy and anticipation. And you know what? No one other than those that know Jesus have that kind of victory, have that kind of hope, that no matter what happens in our life, the worst things that happen, you know, the, we think about death being the worst thing. It's not the worst thing. For a Christian, it's a graduation. It's a blessing. And that really the joy that we have isn't that, you know, everything goes our way or we get everything we ever wished for. It's that we get to be a part of God's story. That we get to be used by him to bring others into the kingdom and to get to know Jesus. Let's bow our heads.
Perhaps today you've been struggling because you need a preview of what's to come. And my uh, uh, appeal to you would be, listen. Pay attention to what God might want to use to encourage you. Uh, maybe it's opening your Bible and, and reading this passage over again and realizing that the disciples were a lot like us. They got things messed up. They got confused. There were times when they were ready to throw in the towel and Jesus always knew what they needed. Sometimes it was a, a word of blessing. Sometimes it was a rebuke. Sometimes it was a, a revelation of his glory. And that God knows what you need today. And so would you ask him to show himself to you, to make himself real in the midst of your questions and your struggle? Maybe you've never made that connection with God. Maybe you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ. And my appeal would be that you would come before him and acknowledge him as Lord and Savior that you'd accept him and put your trust in what he's done for you. That he made the way through the cross, through his resurrection, so that you can have that kind of relationship where you can call God your father. Just simply need to turn your life to him, put your trust in him. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this passage of scripture that reminds us that you're always there for us and that there are times where we need a little glimpse of your presence, of your glory, and of what is to come. And I pray that you'd continue to allow us to be faithful and to hang in there during difficult times and to be a light in a dark world. In Jesus' name.